Welcome to the Mad Trio Podcast. This week we have the California Pariah, Jonathan Charney, James the Fat Man Stevens. And the old guys here. Hello. Rob. <laughs> like I said last week, he's the 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 Mur- he's the ri- uh Murtaugh to our rigs. Uh okay. So you, you, you know, it's from uh, Lethal Weapon, you know. Murtaugh always says, I'm getting too old for this shit. Oh, he's right. <laughs> that's, that's kind of his he, He's right. We do get to a point where it's, it's getting too old. For this. So I wanted to ask Ryan. I know Ryan became a little bit of a wino file or, or, or whatever it is. And I, I saw this replacement <coughs> air. It looks like a can of, um, what is it? That that can, the air, the canned air stuff. But this is yeah. supposed to be for wine. So you put Duster? it. Yeah, it looks like a can of duster, but it's what you do is you you put the little nozzle in the the bottle of wine, hit the button, blow it in there a bit, and, and then you put the stopper it? in it. So basically, what oh, it does so you're trying to make it a sparkling wine. No, basically, what it does is it remove it stops it from oxidizing <clears throat> and it stops the wine from going Excuse bad. Me. Oh, okay. and I was and I was thinking about buying a, a little bo- the bottle of vermouth, but the problem is is because it's fortified wine, and I don't I don't see me using it that much. I was afraid of it going bad on me. So I want to ask him, like, how long has he managed to preserve a bottle of wine? Is it like six months, a year? Because if it's that... You mean uh, an open bottle of wine? Well, yeah, with that dust off, that wine saver stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. how long has he saved it for? Because... And I want to buy a bottle of sweet vermouth. The problem is it may go rancid by by the time I finish. So wouldn't sweet vermouth be considered a white wine? It doesn't that go bad, though. Um, Because vermouth does go... red. Because how long do you think it takes? Because vermouth does go bad. Well, yeah, but I I know people that un, you know uncork a white bottle of wine, take a glass, put the cork back in it, stick it in the refrigerator, and it's good for quite a while. I have to do some more research on it because it was red wine doesn't do that. Red wine correct. you can have it for about five days, depending on the bottle before it starts going vinegar. Oh, really? That fast? Yeah, it doesn't last yeah, hardly at all. No, yeah, it's it's a it goes bad fast. Yeah, it's um, one of those things. You open a bottle of red wine, you need to finish it. So and a lot of people do yeah. just that. Just googling it real yeah. quick. Um, <laughs> once you open your bottle of vermouth, it needs to be stored in the refrigerator. It'll stay in good shape for about a month, and then passable shape for about two months after that. Hmm. So I'll have to ask Ryan because there's there's a couple of things I'm considering for my next purchase. There's a bottle of. Appleton Estate 12-year Jamaican rum for like 65, 70 bucks that I've been eyeing. Oh. It's supposed to be amazing from the reviews I've I've read. So that's that's I'm on the bubble of what what to get. The the question for me is how long could I save that bottle of sweet vermouth? And I just I can't justify a purchase of something like I've had like three drinks in the last what, 6 months? And I had it this weekend, so mm. I don't drink enough. Yeah, so. yeah. No, I know. There's a lot of stuff that, uh, I mean, it's no different than foods, if you just think about it. I mean, you you, know, you put some food in the refrigerator, and it's only going to last so long anyway, so. Yeah, and, and unless you, you freeze it, then you get the, the whole freezer dry thing, the, the freezer burn, too. Yeah, well, that's why I like vacuum packing everything, because get rid of that oxygen in it, and it'll last longer in the freezer. Yeah. So I've been watching clips of complete subject change of Babylon five. And this is to sound weird, I but, but I never, cause I'll send James and the Ryan original? clips of, of, of Babylon five, the original, cause the original, and I didn't know Will Robinson was in Babylon five. He played Lanier. He was one of the, I don't remember the race, you know, the race that had that really weird, like bone now, in the when back. When you say Will Robinson, are you talking from the, the original 60 show, the 60s, uh, yes. money, okay. William, I don't remember his name. Money? Mooney? Really? <laughs> Mooney. Okay. Mo- I don't remember the... You're going to make me Google it. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, I can't remember his name. Um, but he was in it, which I didn't realize. And he was talking about, um, you know, getting the show and in, in, in what happened in this, this clip I saw. Because once I saw it was him, I'm like, okay, now I really want to know more about it so it was it was just super interesting to find a guy who was an old school actor from you know the the the, the 60s days to that it was uh bill M- uh, mooney m-u-m-y um 
So Charles uh, William, I don't know how you mummy. say it. I think, I think he pronounced it mummy. So he was in it. So this is um, a show, the old guy. This is him. But I never, it just, never figured that one out. And for it's it's funny, too, because being as old as a show as it is, still discovering things after watching clips and episodes, like, whoa, you know. And it's still, yeah. it's, I think that's going to be, I don't know if you guys have watched it's actually 66 according to Wikipedia. I think that'll go down as one of the most underrated sci-fi shows in, in history. Underrated? Underrated. It's pretty popular at the time. <laughs> yeah, but I, but the, the thing I think that, that counts on sci-fi science fiction is the longevity of it. And I think, I, I, I think it's kind of obscure now. Like if you talk to people, it's like, oh, what's a great sci-fi show? Oh, they'll say um, the new Battlestar Galactica. They'll say Stargate, Star Trek. But Babylon 5 seems to be in this really weird pattern where people don't remember it. Um, so the joke always was made that they, they copied... Um, with the Cylon, uh, red red eyes going back and forth, they copied uh, Knight Rider, copied a kit from Knight Rider. Uh. So it was always a joke about it. And their sets always seemed to be uh, a series of, did you see how cheesy that set was in the last episode? Yeah. For, for uh, Babylon 5? Babylon or? 5, yeah. That does have kind of this 90s, this 90s vibe to it. There was a, a I don't know if I forwarded it. To, no, I didn't. There's a section. It actually reminds me of... Um, American Gladiators. There's a section. It's like of uh, six by six squares on a grid pattern, and the the six by six, the, the squares themselves are light lighted up, and there's mm-hmm. this giant row of them, and it's like a, a some, something at like a forty five degree angle, then a ninety on there, and it's this whole way down, and so there was a bunch of cheesy sets, but it, the the one thing. And I actually think the sets have aged fairly well because it's the story you're paying attention to generally. It's not as bad. Like if you watch like the 1960s version of Lost in Space, not only was the writing campy, but the sets were campy. I think you can have good writing and campy sets because let's be honest. Let's look at Babylon, not in Babylon 5. Let's look at, um, uh, uh, was it Star Trek, the space station one, Deep Space Nine. Some of those sets were a little hokey off the space station for the first couple of episodes they were borrowing next gen sets and they were seeing kind of their their age yeah i suppose so i mean i so- think most of the sets if you look at them from today's perspective were pretty crappy i mean look at <laughs> i mean that was the reason why i couldn't get into the original star trek growing up is because i looked at the sets and i'm like are you kidding me I just couldn't get into it because I mean, by comparison of what we had in the eighties and nineties, it was already campy at, for that time. So, uh, okay. So seeing it, the original sets at the original time in the sixties for what as show a kid lost in space, uh, no, Star Trek, Star, Star Trek. Trek. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It looked, it, it looked pretty cool being honest. I mean, yeah. it was uh, a, a Friday night show for, for me, most of the time in uh, in high school, Single, which no pissed dates. me off because it was um, away games, band band games, and stuff, and so <clears> we were we were always gone at the time that Star Trek was on. So I had to miss a lot of it. But and you always reruns were kind of tough back then. Trying you always to had it. Doctor Who. Always had Doctor Who. Always did. Interesting enough, I watched. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys are a Stargate fan. I've always been a fan of all the Stargate. I shows. was actually a fan of Stargate. Yeah, I actually was. So I was, what, what impressed me is that I, I sat down to watch the, uh, the 1994 version of Stargate. The and, movie. The, the movie. And uh, yeah. I had completely forgotten that one of my favorite actors. Kurt Russell. Ah, James Spader. Oh, oh he, he yeah, played James the doctor, Spader. right? He plays, yeah, Dr. Jackson. I completely forgot that he played, because I watched The Blacklist, and I love The Blacklist because of James yeah, Spader. I like Blacklist, yeah. Spader is so good, and I had completely forgotten that he was in that movie, and it was like, oh, yeah, There's, boy, talking about looking. <laughs> that's 30 years ago, though, so it's, I'll give him props for that, but he had long hair, and the, he was Man, the heartthrob he, at the he, time. The, the MacGyver, the MacGyver you know, ripoff. You forget how old he is, actually. <laughs> Yeah. However, the the, yeah. the bad guy in that movie, I could have done without seeing at least one of his movies. Um, Crying Game, because he played the, the the bad guy on there. Was it Raw? 
He was in the movie Crying Game. Yeah, well. Good movie up until the end. There's a movie that we could have probably done without. Right? Honestly, it I wasn't it, it wasn't a bad movie. <laughs> it just wasn't a movie that, like, at the end of it, like, it's like, okay, I know this is, is this is a Lost guy. Lost Highway was the only one that I could think of worse that came out about the same time. By the way, this is a spoiler <laughs> alert for, what, a 40-year-old movie, so... Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, old enough <laughs> yeah so like the last scene was the one i wasn't expecting it's kind of like eastern promises and the last scene about that except the fact there's a giant yeah. gi- giant schwanz yeah, on the screen you know. and you're just like i seriously could have done without that but other than that it actually wasn't a bad movie yeah the problem is that crying that game? one scene yeah the crying game that one whole scene ruined the whole movie this is true <laughs> it's because problem, that's so that's that's the last thing you uh, see it's it it's bad. uh it that was the, what do they call the, the, the coup d'etat? Yeah, that ruined it. <laughs> coup de gras. So, so coup de gras. gras. Close so enough. So we've hit a, uh, we've hit a milestone in uh, the country. Wait a minute, let me see. Let me make sure there's something, because it doesn't sound right. Uh, not the country, in the world. The world hit a milestone okay. today. You know what that was? What? One okay. million One million people dead from coronavirus. Wow. So... What is, and I haven't looked this up, do you know what the, how many people die from the flu a year? Is there reporting on? on yeah, I, I Google that, baby, because I bet my, I'm sure it's there. Uh, the seasonal flu kills a certain percentage of people every year. but Because uh, the other thing, I was listening to my favorite radio show on the way home today, and they said there's like a 5% raise of suicides, specifically children, and like, According to them, it's been a lot of children and people who lose everything. Um, and they say total at a U.S. is like, and the, he could have been pulling this, you know, out of thin air, but it's like 0.01% um, flu death. And and I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do what we're doing. I'm just saying, you know, I just, I comparisons to me are interesting. 36,000 people a year die in the United States alone from the seasonal flu. That's just regular Old day, every day. And that's United States or worldwide? That's just United States. Okay. A year. Hmm. Yeah. 36,000. So. Because, you know, f- was it 400? No. F- there's been 6 million, seven, 7 million cases. And hasn't there only been 200,000 deaths? No. Uh, well, the story I was reading is just talking about the world, worldwide. I don't know if, it, let me see if it's got any statistics for just the United States. So while he's um, looking that up, I, I got a random fact for you. You know, the, you know, fancy ketchup, the term is actually better than regular ketchup. What? Yeah. Apparently fancy ketchup is actually a better ketchup than regular ketchup. What is fancy ketchup? Yeah. What is fancy ketchup? I don't know. This is that. That's all they said was that, you know, today I learned that fancy ketchup is a better ketchup than regular ketchup. I mean, look it up. I was just trying to kill time and stop dead air, but. So 200,000 people, let's see, in, on September 22nd, the number hit 200,000 in the United States. So that's a huge difference between, and that's not even a year because it started in one, I think it started counting it in March. Uh, so here, here you have, if 200,000 people have died, so in seven months versus 36,000 for seasonal flu, you can see how much con- more contagious the COVID is and how much more dangerous it really is if you take a look just at those numbers. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> The only th- other thing I, I was thinking about this, <clears throat> about the COVID, is I, I, I kind of wonder, and this is my fault for not looking into it, being a guy who's a history buff, is how was, because the 1918 pandemic, from everything I can remember and I've recently heard, in the summertime, it was, you know, it was very, you know, it was like COVID is now. And then earlier, later in the year, it came back and just became this nasty, massive flu and started killing people left and right. I, I, what did they do diff- like different from now? Because as, as a guy who has to work, I cannot just hide in my house. So that was my, my, my main question is, what do you think people did? My assumption is they all worked. And, and if they did that, what would have been the positive sides if they, if they physically could just hide out for months, you know, cause no, 19, I don't know. cause 1918, that's, that's the end of world war one. So the 1918, 1919 flu 
killed more people than the Great War known today as World War One. Yeah. So more people died in a year <coughs> from the swine flu in, in 1918 <coughs> than with all the people that were killed, all the men and women and children that were killed in World War One. Yeah. So my, my question is, if they were able to do kind of what we did in the first couple of months of this and people were laid off, government supported, because don't, don't forget, this is before a lot of the New Deal programs. This is a lot, you know, this is way before mo actually all of those. And there wasn't really a government safety net. If there was such a thing, would have would the same thing happen? Because I'm having a hard time compar comparing the two because straight up how deadly it is. The virus literally burned itself out. And last time I heard, and this was a long ass time ago, they don't have any viable strains of the 1918 pandemic flu to even like to make some sort of antiviral agent for it. Um, Okay, yeah. if you say so, I I I would believe that there are government laboratories that definitely have well, it could copies it, of the swine flu. It could be one of like I mean that the particular eighteen particular virus. Yeah, I it bet could, they do. It could. Well, the last time I heard they didn't, but on the other hand, it could be one of those things that they They're don't want. Tell you they do. They're going to say, "Hey, we've got it. What a great way to weaponize." Something, well, that's what I'm going right? to say. It could be one of these things, plausible deniability. Yeah. Like they, you know, they say that they have copy, you know, that they have these diseases they've eliminated, but you know, they've admitted to it because there's been a lot of stuff to get rid of like polio, for example, and smallpox and. Right. Well, that, you know, that's vaccines have been the reason why we've been able yeah. to get rid of uh, smallpox and tuberculosis and all, you know, the diseases that killed so many people before we, before we got to the point. And that's why I have such a hard time with the anti-vaxxers. I mean, there's, there's. It's, you know, if you don't want to look at the science, look at the numbers. I mean, it's just <coughs> incredible uh, how much vaccinating people have saved. <coughs> yeah. So. But I also understand this, the anti-vaxxers point of worrying about it. Because when you heard that there's mercury in some of these. There's nothing side effect free. All right. Well, so I, like, whatever you do, there's a risk level, right? Well, yes, but no, I, I don't disagree, but I, I do, I don't blame some of these anti-vaxxers for wanting to know what else they're, they're, they're dealing with. Cause I do know somebody whose kid was heavily affected badly by a vaccine. Um, so my, my, I, so I don't blame them for wanting to know. So, cause you know, as a parent, you have to balance out what's best for the kid. So I, I don't blame them for asking because I'd want to know. I mean, hell, I'm I'm pro Prop 65, and I routinely take pictures of Prop 65 stuff. Um, I recently took one in a, and it's a, kind of a catch-all department store, sells clothes, cooking, etc. And right on top of where all they have all the pots and pans, there's a Prop 65 warning. I've seen on makeup, women's underwear, sunglasses, coffee shops. And Prop 65, if you don't know about it in the state of California, basically stating that the, the ingredients in said area or and or product can, can contain may. Can, may contain cancer causing chemicals, et cetera. Yeah. And so and I, I've had a lot of people <clears throat> outside of California ask me, what is with the California cancer? Because that's <laughs> what they call it. They call it, it, you know, when they see it in other states, they're just like, so it only causes cancer in California. Well, Prop 65 also <laughs> is covering lead. Yeah, that's the main the main component in 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 Prop sixty five. So, yes, there's there's a possibility of there being a certain amount of lead in everything. So I never yeah. so I never and so, asbestos and asbestos, especially not, in not certain much, parts of California. Yes, yeah. <laughs> when I bought my first house, <clears throat> there was a multi uh, maybe in my current house there were multi page documents of. This area has been known to contain asbestos, natural occurring asbestos. If you, yeah, you know, that basically saying if you dig it up, watch your, it's your ass type of thing. Well, we, well, that's the thing. California has asbestos everywhere. I mean, that's one of the, um, what building is it? Is it the, is it the court C building in possible that has that big chunk of asbestos under that glass case? Probably. Yeah. I'm, I'm not but, sure. But yeah. I mean, it grows. It, it's, naturally occurring around here i shouldn't say it grows but it yeah it is naturally it you, you got it it's naturally occurring around here yeah in in our area we yeah. have uh we have a, a lot of areas in the serpentine rock that's in this area that has um <coughs> asbestos in it i mean it's just it's part and parcel <coughs> yeah so 
So I, I, I'm all for knowing what's in stuff. I mean, I think as a parent, it's your right to know what you're putting into your, your, your children and yourself. Now, I may not understand the extent that some of these anti-vaxxers go. Well, well you know, I, I okay. Think- so the thing is that a lot of these anti-vaxxers, one of the things they bring up is, and it's not, it's scientifically proven that if you kill a certain bacteria or parasite or organism multiple times at the same way, it's going to basically evolve into a different strain that is resistant to that. So if you take a certain amount of the virus, whatever you're trying to kill, and you sit there and you put it in billions of our population, that little tiny percent that isn't fully dead because that's the vaccine is the actual virus and not all of it is dead can evolve into a more vaccine or uh, resistant strain, which is what became SARS and the bird flu and possibly now COVID as well. So that's one of the things they, they complain about is that, but, Okay, so I mean that's going to happen regardless. My understanding, and not being a, a doctor, I probably have this wrong, but my understanding is for most of what you're really talking about are more bacteria strained viruses, or not viruses, but bacteria and antibiotics. And the whole reason why we don't want to be taking antibiotics all the time is because it's becoming less and less effective. Yeah. So that that's with bacteria. Now, in, influenzas they <clears throat> do. Um, uh, change in in what uh, in a little way because they, they they mutate because right? they're saying COVID is mutated. They're saying yeah. that there's some different strains of COVID now out there that it has yeah. mutated. So that hence may be part of the problem with also you know trying to get a vaccine that's going to be effective for every strain. It's the same problem that you have with getting a seasonal flu shot. I mean you, they they take a wag as to okay what might what seasonal flu may pop up this year. And this is what we're going to put into the seasonal flu strain. So the other thing a lot of people understand also with uh, uh, vaccines for influenzas is that the vaccine doesn't stay, the, the, the shot that you get doesn't stay with you at that full strength uh, very long. Uh, it's about three months at the high level, and then it keeps degrading all the way through. So after a year, you would more than likely not have any antibodies so it's like um, tetanus. Yeah. you got to get a boost every once in a while. Some kind of idea, I assume. But this is, influences are particularly worse with that. You ha- That's why you have to get a shot every year because it just doesn't stay with you. <laughs> and that's the one thing I've heard. And I, I don't, I don't want to talk about COVID for too long because it's kind of a depressing subject. That's the one thing I heard of COVID is they're trying to figure out how long does it actually last for, the, the antibodies. And I'm just going to have a quick... Um, Subject change before giving it to Rob. I see he has something he wanted to talk about. I recently, and I don't believe I did this, uh, Paris Hilton has a do- YouTube original documentary. And it's actually super interesting because it talks about how the Paris Hilton you saw in the media is a complete act. It is yeah. incredibly interesting actually listening to at least what apparently is the real person behind the brand Paris Hilton. So I check it out to YouTube original. It's it's it, if you got a, a quick pick to watch, it's like an hour plus it's, it, it's, I find it fascinating. So it talks about her life. In that. <clears throat> yeah. It talks about her life in our Paris Hilton. Well, see the interesting thing. It talks about the rise uh, of Paris Hilton with a sex tape. It talks about how she, I guess was kind of a party girl and got sent to Provo, Utah, uh, Utah in the yeah. school there. And the massive amount of abuse, like literally these people kidnapped her in the middle of the night and did all sorts of horrible stuff to her. Not sexually, but but pretty bad. Excuse me. Um, yeah. And talks about her going over that and the trust issues it caused. It talks about her 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 dating life. Like every time she dates a new, uh, gets a new, uh, ends a relationship, she buys a new MacBook. And she had this stack of MacBooks. And some <laughs> of them had, were like bent sideways and dings because I guess boyfriends had a tendency to grab one and fling them. And I don't know why you would grab somebody's laptop and fling them. And it's, it's just, this, they're assholes. Right? She dates assholes. Yeah. 
and it's just super interesting to to see that and then you get to see from her her sister's side and her mom's side and it's it's just a super interesting documentary because i remember when she was rising to fame and she had this you know she had this very vacuous personality you know like everybody thought oh the smartest thing about her is when she leaves a room and it turns out she seems to be f- incredibly intelligent if she's able to maintain that brand without nobody really knowing t- her. No, yeah. well, good for her. Um, not being Paris Hilton, we're going to talk about something kind of sad, but yet interesting to watch what happens. Oh, great. That, more, uh, more sadder than COVID? Yeah, well, for me anyway. So Remington has finally finished bankruptcy. The courts have finally really? said that Remington Arms Company is now uh, has to or will not escape the latest bankrupt's filing act that was placed against them. And so they're going to be broken up into multiple parts. And so uh, from from my sources, uh, it looks like Ruger is going to take now. So many of you probably don't know, uh, Remington was more than just Remington Arms. It's Remington Man and Ammunition. They owned uh, a number of different companies, including, including Marlin Firearms and... Uh, uh, huh. Uh, I didn't know they were part of Marlin. Yeah. So Ruger is going to take over Marlin. That's kind of an interesting purchase. I I thought Ruger and Marlin, there might be a fit there somewhere. I'm not sure where. Maybe in the, uh, I'm not sure where Ruger's going to fit in with Marlin. It's going to bring in a lot of different lines into uh, Ruger, and that might be good. Well, that's probably what they need is a little bit more diversification. And I think that's why they're going to do it, yeah. And I think Ruger's quality control may be a little bit better at this point because towards the end there, Remington was slipping pretty bad with that on Marlin. Vista Outdoors gets gets to get the uh, Lone Oak ammunition part. That's uh, Sarah Bullets and Control of Barnes, which is a big deal. Um, that, that's a, that's a multi, multi, multi million dollar deal in itself, uh, with, the uh, uh, Remington ammunition. Apparently the, the line will stay with the name, but it's going to be controlled different. And they, we don't know what's going to happen as far as the bullets and primers and other stuff that they made as well. Um, Bushmaster, Bushmaster, which many people didn't know that Remington, uh, also owned because it's going to go to Franklin Armory Holdings. So there goes the Bushmaster part over onto that side. We'll see what they do with that. Uh, not a big fan of a whole lot of Bushmaster stuff, but a lot of people love it. Sure. So, but anyway, yeah, it's kind of a an end of the era. Uh, so I was yeah. I was looking. This was the na- na- nation's la- uh, oldest gunmaker. But uh, I'm looking this over, but it's not the same company. I'm trying was trying to figure out because I remember hearing something about they went bankrupt at some point. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, it, it, there, it wasn't, it wasn't Remington arms company per se. That was the name of what they worked under. It, it was a holding company. Um, so until 2015, Remington arms was part of the freedom group, which was owned and operated by Sybaris capital management in 2014. Um, I'm going to, I'm curious in the research, like when did it get, Oh, here we go. On March 7th, 1888, 1888, ownership of E. Remington and Sons was sold by Remington family to new two owners, a Marcellus Hartley and partners. So pretty much the family sold out of the company in 1888. Oh, yeah. They've been long gone out so of it. So that's what I was trying to figure out is where's the, 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 the actual lineage of the company. So basically. Yeah, it's not, it's been, it's, it has not been a family-owned company such like Ruger. Yeah. Uh, but the, the Remington is, of course, much older. And so, yeah, the family was gone a long time ago on that part. So, but it's, you know, it's, uh, everything changes. So it's, here we are. And, uh, and for those of you ha- that have been trying to purchase, since this is, uh, September of 2020, purchase ammunition and firearms all over the <coughs> country. It's been a incredible period of time of people panicking and hoarding. Uh, ammunition itself, plus uh, if you're into reloading components, powders, primers, bullets, extremely scarce and trying to get anything. Uh, you think they'd be making money on ammunition alone? Uh, it's just they, they can't keep up with the demand. The demand has skyrocketed, rocketed, and, I, and it's interesting how it just keeps it's getting worse and worse as the closer and closer we get to the presidential elections. I find this very interesting. 
there are some people that are freaking out about it. Well, huh. I mean, if, if, if you want to go down the rabbit hole a little bit, you know, with, with this, with this particular election, I think they had, there's a little bit more valid concern over previous elections. And that's that, and that's solely based in my opinion, based on, you know, previous, you know, who's running and, and so previous histories, et cetera. Federal law enforcement, <clears throat> whichever alphabet soup you want to go down with or whatever, are saying that they're expecting civil unrest no matter who wins the election. There was a guy, you talked about that, there was a guy who actually predicted in the next so many years, there's by like 2030, I, I got to find the article if I can find it, basically said America's going to have another civil war in, in the next so many years. Yeah, I heard that. You know, the we've become so... Yeah, I, I don't understand how... Um, how we're walking so far away from the Constitution and how our current Supreme Court isn't stepping up to take on some of the cases that would maybe help with some of the friction that we have going on within this country, and they're just refusing to, to hear them. And um, I, 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 personally, I'm, I'm a bit confused on the whole thing. I'm going, you know, I think there's some ways that we could be dealing with the, the, the civil situation that we're dealing with now better uh, and maybe, <coughs> so I, I, all right. So it comes down to disenf disenfranchised <coughs> citizens or voters, any way you look at it, maybe both. Right. So we've got people on all sides that are saying, you know, I don't, I don't have a, uh, a horse in this race, um, simply because we're having to settle for whatever we, we currently have, because we believe what we currently have might continue to support the opinion we have now. And then the, the other party that's trying to get in power saying, you know, no, we, 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 we need to do things in a different way, in a different manner. And you're literally getting people in the country that just go, none of this really applies to me. And it gets back to the old question of the electoral college. People don't understand why we have the Electoral College. I know a person that has personally has two PhDs <coughs> that simply does, does not understand the difference between the Electoral College and and, and the the majority vote. See, I and, think it's I think it's I, th I think it's a little bit more simpler than than that. Simpler? No, I, I get much simpler than that. Well, no, I see. I, I I think it's a different way. I don't think it's a constitutional. People don't get it. I think it's a societal issue, and I, I really do think it's, and, and some people think I'm crazy for thinking this. I think what it is is we're becoming a more secular society, and for America, who was basically a very religious society up until recently, when like the last 100 years, um, we all had some sort of mutual understanding. Like there, there's a pastor I once heard that said, when you wanted to bring up concepts, you'd have to bring in like for certain things, you'd bring in a biblical concept to explain a secular concept. He said, nowadays in church, you bring up a secular concept to, to explain a biblical concept. So basically what I'm trying to say is I think what it is, is we have opposing worldviews and people are all trying to find their group. Um, I've always said we should all unite under one banner. We're all Americans, you know, Christian American, black Americans, gay Americans. We're all Americans. And this friend of mine comments like, no, it has been proven to be healthy that you're a gay, transsexual, something black American, and you need this. Like, you have to identify yourself by all these little groups instead of being, you're all of that, but under the American banner. And I, I think that's what it is. I think it's a societal breakdown of where we identify because now – now, we're so deep in that rabbit hole that the conservatives and the, the liberals have such an appeal, com competing worldview that it's now coming to a head. Because the worldviews are completely different now on one side or another. From the extreme points, it's 100% it's true. So I think it's a worldview issue. Worldview on freedoms, worldview on governments, worldview on religion worldview on on personhood and etc 
Well, <laughs> so this is speak for the fact that uh, the average human being in this world is more enlightened <laughs> than they were 100 years ago? I've more met, educated? I've met plenty of educated people that can't change a tire. A, well, you know, don't get me started about shop classes. Well, no, no. Basically, what I'm saying is <laughs> I, I think <clears throat> I think what we need to do is is what what is education? What are you considered? Well, that's why I call the term enlightened. Because enlightened is, I mean, more aware of your surrounding and what's going on. More aware of what your, 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 your country is all about and what's going on with the world in your country. So are, are people more enlightened in, in this is why, that, you know, they're all going now, well, hey, in the United States, they can be whatever they want to be. They can be whatever gender they want to be. They can be whatever name, pronoun, whatever it is they want, they can. And here we are sitting here and we're repressed. And so maybe there's an issue in other worlds and why there's all these other countries, of course, that, that they don't want that information getting uh, over to their citizens because they don't want them. And they're knocking on their doors trying to answer the questions. Um, so, yeah, you know, where, where are you going with that? Well, see, here's <clears throat> so looking it up on the dictionary, there's two. Oh, not that Doug on dictionary. So, there's two. Which version? So, this is whatever <laughs> Apple uses. So, it's not the 1865, you know, <laughs> which I know people who prefer the old dictionary, but there's so two. The Urban Dictionary? Urban. This is the Onion you, Dictionary. You want me to look up Dirty Sanchez? Um, <clears throat> So number two, on the, the number two is the one I'm looking at. It says <laughs> enlightenment is a European intellectual movement of the late 17th and 18th centuries that emphasized reason and individualism rather than tradition. It was heavily influenced yeah. by the 17th, 17th, 17th century philosophers such as Descartes, Locke, Newton, etc. Yeah, um, exactly. I, I, I um, see the only thing I don't quite understand it because it's something I've been thinking about a lot and I, 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 I definitely agree that I definitely believe it's a worldview issue, but is it, I don't think it's lack of choices because I'm a hundred percent for, for people, whether I agree with it or not people doing whatever they want, it's their lives. You, you live the life as long as you're not violating my right, you can do whatever you want. I don't care. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I really don't understand what is, what is happening. And I've spent considerable amount of time reflecting on talking to people who I know who are practically fucking communist to people who are the most conservative people I've ever met. And, and nobody seems to have a right answer or at least an answer that makes sense. Why I've, would you expect somebody to have the right answer? Uh, yeah. What yeah, do you yeah, consider the right, the right answer? answer? Yeah. Well, well the, the, the right answer to me would be something <laughs> that, so this is what it is. So somebody gives me an answer. I'd be sitting down and reflecting on it going, okay, this makes sense. This fits in within the narrative I'm seeing. This makes sense to you. Yeah. Well, yes, because if it makes sense, that's to me, all that matters to Jonathan. It's his world. Well, no, but if, if it makes sense to me, <laughs> then I can explain it to somebody else. And if uh, I say, yeah, this is, you know, this yeah, is what it's I the know, conversation. Know, it's, it's all, it, it's all broad brush strokes. but you know, I'm, I'm not, not hundred percent certain what that had to do with the fact that I was talking about our constitution in our country, but because I, I think, I think I'm trying to focus on which just affects us. What's, no, what's going over in China right now, other than the, the flu. Well, because I think this does affect us. I think the, the, <clears throat> the reason why people don't understand the basics of the constitution, why, um, the, what you were talking about, the, the, the electoral college is important right. to individual states right. happens to be because it's, 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 the lack of uniting under a common banner and, and the reason why is because of blank. It's okay. And the reason why simply has to do with population bases in this country. And, and yeah. that's the reason we have the electoral college because otherwise us sitting here and we, we already have this problem in California because where we sit in California has absolutely no effect on the way the votes go in this state. And it's the yep. same thing for many other states in the middle of this country that does not have the population bases that, <sighs> that New York City has, that uh, Los Angeles has, that San Francisco has, that <coughs> all the high population concentrated areas that we get most of our news from and, and most <clears throat> of the talking heads from and uh, the rest of the country could literally just stay home and not vote and wouldn't change a doggone thing if it wasn't for the Electoral College. Well, if we didn't have the Electoral College, 
California would vote for the entire West Coast into what I mean, at least four or five states in. Oh, well, California, Oregon, and Washington would control almost half of the United States alone. Yeah. Yeah. So. But that that goes back to, I think, my argument of, and and your comment about the enlightenment, because this was something that our founders realized that everybody has to have a voice. And I, I think that the cultural issue is what's real, which making everybody say no your voice isn't important because you're this and you're not that i I think what it is is we've come to a point where in individualism is so important that the natural flow of what makes america great doesn't work like when my your our forefathers came here for a better life they realized hey i can work my ass off but i can do good now that's no longer there. That's no longer an option because, oh, I'm not this or I'm not that. I, I think what it is is we're searching, people are searching for an identity, and I think that's affecting the country because people no longer know who they are. You don't know who you are? I mean, people, well, if you think about it, by nature, people pe- people go for somebody who is similar to them. Um Jews lived in the Jewish area, Czechs lived in the Czech area, et cetera. And I think what it is, is people are so polarized that the benefits of the the electoral college, the benefit of the system, I mean, it's not perfect, but I think the people are, are have, don't understand the benefits of the system because they're looking for their own identity. It's, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I do think this is what's affecting it because I first noticed it when I was a kid and I, I remember hearing stuff that, oh, this community and that community. And I remember thinking, well, we're, we're all Americans. Why are they so divided? Not realizing, okay, for the black and the white community, there's a history of injustice. There's a history of this. But then, you know, I don't want to get too down the rabbit hole on that. But So let's, let's, I'm going to step way back and take a further look at it. And let's look at the immigration to the United States. Why did many, not all, but I would bet the majority of people, why did they immigrate here? It was to flee the tyranny that they were living in in their, their own home countries. And a chance to do better. Right? So they, they, they fled and they came over here to the United States. And we still have pockets in the larger city areas of, you have the Italian area, you have the uh, Asian area, you Jewish have area. the Jewish area, you have what, you know, you, we still have that. That still exists, not in the majority of the country, but in pockets throughout the country that still Yeah, like, like San Francisco has Chinatown. Uh, well, so does New York City. Yeah, and they have, you know, like the little, the, the little Tokyo. Little Italy. And, and, yeah. Yes, exactly. And that still goes on to, to today. And, you know, and, that, and, and that's all right. It doesn't make them not Americans. It makes them ha- want to have some identity with their ethnic group that they came over to this country, that they were repressed from in their home countries and why they came here. My problem always is, is that, okay, so you're coming to another country, you're fleeing your country for a particular reason, you're coming over to this country, you get here and then you say, hey, no, we want to do it like we used to do at the home country. And, and I have a problem with that. I mean, the whole reason you fled was to flee the tyranny and the, you know, the, the non-choices that you probably had, and you're trying to flee and get a better life, and yet now you want to change something to be like it was where you were at, doesn't make sense to me. That's why I know for for our grandparents, our great-great-great-great-great-grandparents that came over here, uh, they, they didn't want to talk the, the home tongue anymore. They didn't you know, want to talk about what was there. They were going to be Americans. And you came here, you learned English. You came here, you became part of a big uh, country and part of what America was all about. We've lost that. We have. Yeah. But because our, our, our forefathers, you know, they were, you know, they were whatever, but became Americans. I think that's the, the thing is they became Americans. It, you know, what was it? E pubis unum through many one. Well, so yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I don't know what the naturalization rate is now, but, I, you know, there's still millions of people that come here who want <clears throat> to be Americans and want what we have, and yet we've got all these 
Americans that are unhappy about what we have, and they want to change that. Well, it's, it's, and it's very confusing for many of the you know the the people that have that are immigrating here or trying to make a life here. They're going, I don't get it. It's the first world problem because Starbucks is out of my favorite latte. I mean, it's it's this. It's the, my life is so hard because I can't have blank. And usually blank is a small, minute, really unimportant in the small ideal of things. Um, I've always kind of, I believe lately that when you don't have big shit to worry about, little shit becomes annoyingly fucking important. Like, oh, my life is so easy because I've got a car, I've got a roof, I've got food. So now my car got scratched. That becomes the thing that blows up your world because you have this insignificant problem. And I, I think that's the issue. I think I'd rather have the insignificant problems than oh, the big 100%, ones, right? Oh, 100%. But I, I think we're we're so myopic about that. I think we're all Mr. Magoo so much that I don't think we we can step back and see the forest through the trees. You know, Do you expect people to know who Mr. Magoo is? I, I already use ancient references. <laughs> if they don't know what it is, they, you know, they can... Ancient comic references. Yeah. I used to have all the stuff on DHS, Mr. Magoo. Well, you know, if if if, if they don't want to What's look up VHS? my my favorite uh, my video home system, <laughs> the latest and greatest of home entertainment. Yes, watch movies tape. at home. Put everything on this magnetic tape. It's all um, coming back. <laughs> da da da. As old as new again. Um. Hey, it's coming back. I hope not. Um. I don't know. I I just think that's. I think that's the biggest issue. And I, I actually think Ryan would agree with this is no, nah. you know, Ryan has to be here to agree with things. <laughs> I, I think he would. It's like when, when big problem, there's no big problems to worry about. Everybody worries about little problems. I, and you know what? I think that's just the way it is. You're absolutely right. I mean, your biggest worrying point is whatever the next thing is on the horizon for you for a worrying point. Yeah. And like art, art, I think, you know, James's forefathers and our forefathers would have realized, it's like, dude, I haven't eaten in four days and you're worried about fucking left coffee, you know? <laughs> I, I, I think that's the issue is the fact I think we're a little too myopic of, I, I don't think we reflect enough and I think that's the problem. Okay, so reflecting, it's interesting that you said that because one of the things that I've been reflecting since we're on reflecting and Wayback Machine may go back on this one, do, do, but, do, do, do. <laughs> but Sherman set the way back machine in 1965. I, I uh, understand the the BLM situation. I think I've educated myself enough on it, and I truly understand where these people are coming from. Yeah, but go back in history just a, a little bit, and you find that um, people of all races and creeds, whatever it may be to a degree, have all been discriminated against in one way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, you look back into uh, the times of the Romans, they seemed to like to enslave anybody that they conquered. It didn't matter what you were, uh, what color you were. Uh, you got to remember, they had a big love affair with Egypt for a long time. They didn't care about that, but they enslaved an awful lot of them. Uh, Jews have historically been enslaved. Um, They've been everybody's target in today. <laughs> everybody's story. target in today. You know, well, look at Hitler did. So I look mean, at Europe now. Well, There's a huge rise in anti-Semitism. Yeah, it's I, I, I don't know. I so <clears throat> so I understand. I can totally sympathize with BLM being of Jewish descent. Uh, understanding that uh, you know just because of where we came from or who our parents chose to marry or whatever it may be, you're going to be discriminated against. And, uh, so it's, it's, it, I can certainly look at it and understand it. Answer me this though. What do you think about reparations? <laughs> so I've got a particular family, a member of mine, extremely angry at me the, years ago. So I'm going to be very careful with this <laughs> and just say, this, this is, this, this is about the show for that. We're supposed to lay it out here and <clears throat> let's go at what do you think? So my, my opinion of this has always been, if you find somebody who is a slave or whose life has been, or was a slave, who was a slave or whose life has been seriously affected by racism, I'm okay with with that, but 
the first thing is if you find a slave, the motherfucker's 200 years old, give him money. So um, shouldn't, shouldn't the biggest <clears throat> form then, if we're, we're here in this wonderful United States of America, one of the largest countries in the world, and there were people on it before, before we even started our first encampment or pulled up a Plymouth Rock or whatever it may be. Called that's that's going to be next. That, that we talk Native Americans, and should they not be the ones that there's, should be out there talking there's, about reparations? There's already talk about that on social media. The only problem, and this is going to sound really bad. I don't mean to sound as bad as it is. They just don't have as good a PR. Um, because I've, I've, there, I've seen that well, in a couple of places re- regarding, we have segregated them so <clears throat> badly. That's the problem, right? We rounded them <clears throat> up and stuck them on these reservations and that's kind of where they're at. They, they haven't dispersed in any large quantities throughout the country. I think that's <clears throat> part of their issues as well. I, the only thing I can say on that, and I've said this for a long time, is changing people's attitudes regarding things takes a long time. And I still think regarding racism, if you compare... How um, about when we recognize it for what it was? No, I agree. What it is. And we go, okay, it was egregious. Should have never happened. Uh, it, it, it was the way it was back then. I mean, wars and killing and tribal stuff has been going on since man walked this earth they're proving it started even before a homo sapien that you know we always fought each other yeah always and 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 what i was what i was saying was if you take a look from the emancipation proclamation took place to modern times an amazing amount of far as the african-american racism african-american racism amazing amount of stuff has been done we've changed there has been a huge shift in momentum. It been went from racism was okay to no, 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 hold on there. Absolutely. Is, is it perfect? No. If you also take a look at um, homosexuality, it went from, in a matter of a decade, went from being a no-no to accepted. Human history, that's incredibly fucking fast. Uh, so so all, all I'm saying is, is I agree. I know we, a number of gay Americans that would, probably argue with you about it it changed in a decade <laughs> well no like if no you're right but i mean if you compare from when it been from completely culturally unacceptable to acceptable to that's that's fast i mean the reality thinking that's that's incredibly fast if you think about it from no to yes that didn't happen with like if you came as far as emancipation proclamation like 10 years and if you got a lot of groups who are more acceptable, is it perfect? No, but, but so that was our catchphrase of the day: enlightenment. That's yeah. that's what <clears throat> what I was talking about. The fact is that the information is getting there more. People are being enlightened quicker, faster, in more ways than we ever have before, and that's why I think things can culturally can change so quickly. I don't believe I'm about to quote my cousin on this. Enlightenment is a double-edged sword. Oh, that hurt. Um, I, I think I want to wash your mouth out. Seriously. Mm. Um, anybody got me any mercure chrome? I can gargle. Well, I, I think, I, I think the the issue Clorox. is you can, I think you can be too enlightened or maybe enlightened the wrong way. I think there's a problem with that, but I, I couldn't, I can't put my finger on it or in it, but I think that's the, the, the issue there is I think maybe enlightenment can go too far. Hmm. I don't. I mean, How can knowledge go too far? Because if if your brain and your feet don't go together, <laughs> you're you know you're going to sit and spin for a while, and I think that's what it what it takes. I think it takes knowledge and action. I mean, I'm I'm not. I'm really. I'm explaining myself poorly. That's but, unusual. So <laughs> I don't think the situation is is that. Uh, I don't think anything's going to change as far as that goes. I think, if anything, the, the speed of knowledge and light is going to be even quicker. And, and one of the things that, uh, obviously, the, not obviously, 
One of the things that's taking place during this particular election cycle that we're looking at right now is also <clears> the fact that they're talking about fake news, fake information, wrong information, whatever it may be. And you see it almost daily. Uh, I mean, CNN talking about Fox, talking about whatever it may be. Nobody's got the right story. And uh, it seems Nobody like... Nobody cares. Yeah. And they don't care to report the right story anymore. They only, well, they, I guess that's right. I guess they they look at their demographics of, of what the people must be watching them. They say, "Hey, we've got to point point the news towards this point of view." Modern yellow because journalism because that's who's watching us. It, modern yellow journalism. If it bleeds, it leads. It it's it's just I'm just watching this whole thing up up to this election and all the stuff that's going down, and it's just a mind blower. I mean, you you know, we've got a. a, a a woman who's being nominated to be on the United States Supreme Court, who you have the Speaker of the House coming and saying, we can't, uh, well, of course, she's being in the House, uh, Speaker of the House being in the House, she doesn't have a voice in the matter, but saying that, you know, she's going to send DACA back and that, you know, we're not going to have that and people aren't going to have medical insurance and everything's going to go back because of her religion. But she also, I thought we were enlightened. But she, I, I read an article yesterday that said, she said, we cannot, the uh, Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said, we cannot talk about our Catholic faith. That would be improper. <laughs> but that's the whole reason they're pointing to the change in possibly Road versus Wade. And the whole reason but why they even, don't want her but is the, because of her religion. Even she said, the, the lady said, um, that it, she doesn't think it would be possible to overturn Roe v. Wade. I, I think so. I heard something interesting. And I hope it's not because I, you know, that I believe that that's my opinion. But, but on the religious side, when they look at it for a religious side, but particularly at the Catholic religion, that's an absolute no no. <clears throat> well, this, this particular judge, uh, I heard a little bit of a, a, an interview with her. She said, you cannot, when judging, you have to judge by the law and not by your personal in, intentions. Ah, uh, but this is Supreme Court. So this is interpretation of the Constitution. They have to yeah. look at things completely different than a superior court judge sitting there making a judgment on a drug addict. <clears throat> totally different. Totally different. So I heard something, and we're, we're coming up to the end of the program. I did hear something that this reminded me of, is when the, Gu the, Gert when the press came along. Right? Was it the Gutenberg, <laughs> Gutenberg Press? Yes. When that came around, there's a lot of leaflets and false information that, that happened, and it took a while for people to you know call bullshit on bullshit. And oh, misinformation has been out there from I think the difference telling stories. I think the difference now is the speed. I think the newer right. generation might be hopefully better at <coughs> understanding what's bullshit, like not trusting. So maybe, maybe what it is is the next generation, like James and our kids, maybe they're just going to not trust anything. So it's going to be harder to pass off the truth because you're going to have to be convincing that it is the truth. So maybe we're going to see the possibility of, and, and this kind of goes back to some sci-fi and uh, people are looking into the future of thought police, uh, idea police, uh, no, sorry, that's wrong police. Uh, you know, this could, be, this could be leading into a whole, <laughs> a whole avenue of now, you, you know, not only are you, are you saying you can't think that way, well, wokeovists, they're already there. What? Wokeovists. Wokeovists. Um, it's a term I heard today. I I I, I like. Um, a lot of these woke, these overly woke people, think that oh, you can't think this, you can't think that. You know, uh, uh, political correctness has always been that to a way. Beyond not calling a black person an N word, it got really extreme. Oh, you're this, you're this. The there's a joke about you can't call a prostitute a prostitute a prostitute. She's a a, a, a sexual maintenance partner. You, you, yeah. you, you know, it's, I think that was part of it. I think it's always been there. Well, but I'm, I'm talking about actually almost at a state level now, because at what point do we call bullshit bullshit? Right. I mean, so there, you, you know, you, you look in this election, it's happening right now. And, and it's, it's just like, who do you believe? What do you believe? You know, it, it comes I'm a conservative. To, I don't believe anybody. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, I, that's, it's actually the opposite of what you're, you're saying. I think if you're conservative, you have a firm belief in something. No, I have if, ideals. I just don't trust. I don't believe what anybody is spouting. Well, 
Uh, that's more because I follow politics yeah, too closely. I don't know. I don't know. It's just because you are who you are. I, I don't know any. You have the right to be that way. Well, I don't know. Any I will. Happy. I don't know anybody. Who I trusts. will stand up and allow you to say whatever it is you believe to say. John's a hippie. John's a hippie. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm a hippie. Well, I'm more liberal than you, so I, I'm not quite sure. You don't trust the. You don't trust the government. How does that make me a hippie? I figured it makes me intelligent. No, you're a hippie. Yeah, ask that to the people hey, who man, in the Tuskegee down with the experiment. Man. Down with the man. Yeah, down with the man. Down with the man. <laughs> However, I, I, I really like saying the word groovy because it really tweaks people off. <laughs> See, you're a hippie. Why, why, is, why would it tweak people off? It's in I don't the dictionary. Know. I have, I've said groovy <laughs> and trippy before, and some people just go. <laughs> well, you know, you we're raised with parents that were <laughs> so I in think, that era. So you come by it naturally. Um, How's that? I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting that couple of years, no matter who wins. Um, Cause there's some benefits of both. I mean, if you, you actually, if you can look at it objectively, even though it's really hard, incredibly difficult actually. So I wonder, I wonder looking at what we're in now, I, you know, I'm looking back in my little bit of history and, and trying to figure out. So was the, they talked about JFK and Nixon during the first election cycle when JFK got elected president. One of the things that w- that took place during that period of time, and we may have talked about this before, had to do with um, Nixon uh, was under these really hot lights and he sweated a lot, where JFK didn't, and they were they were saying that ideas and opinions were changed just by that one interview alone. Because of the way, yeah, I heard about that too. Because of the way, because of the way he looked, and so I, you know, you start looking at misinformation or what, what kind of information. So you go back there. So they, 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 the JFK side pounced on that like crazy and brought that up, going, "Look, this man's sweating. He's hot. He can't be telling the truth." Um, and it was a very interesting. You start reading this stuff about what took place. Even in our, you know, my short period of time, was, I was way too young to remember that, so I wouldn't know. But uh, still, it was uh, uh, it was very interesting to think that something as simple as one debate, uh, because one man was sweating and the other wasn't, was enough to turn the tide towards him. And you have to remember at the time, JFK, being Catholic, was uh, t- to many people was like, oh my God, the world's coming to the end. Because we're electing sure. a Catholic president, so it's it's very interesting to to see where we've come, but to look back at our past, and uh, as many of our history teachers would probably have told you, is that look at the past to see what the future may bring. Yeah, well, not very many teachers teach that these days, honestly. That's a good slogan. I should put that on a bumper sticker. That's an awfully long slogan. <laughs> Look at the past to see what your future may bring. Yeah, you're going to have to shorten it a little bit. Yeah, well, anyway, that I thought I'd leave, I'd leave that that one ringing statement to wrap up the show. Wait, can you can can you say that again? But add con- Confucius Confucius say. <laughs> no, Confucius didn't say that, but he may have said something similar. <laughs> Probably shorter too. We'll have to look. <laughs> Uh, wrap it up john let's go well ladies and gentlemen to quote bill s Teston and fred theodore th- and fled no, <laughs> screw it and ted let's, let's ruin the yeah whatever the i had a perfect ending like be excellent to one another well, obviously you didn't oh and no. ladies and gentlemen Are we actually doing it wait a minute wait a minute stop <clears throat> what did you say be, be, be excellent, excellent to, to each, each other, other. Do you, do you realize the new thing that's going on in the media today is that every one of these talking heads is ending up with something that's like, be kind to your neighbor. Be nice to what you say. So you, you just fit right into it. That just, that wrapped it up, folks. Thanks. Oh, I can, I can go. Well, that yeah, was one, you, you know, I'm going to switch it up. It's like, well, that was one hell of a clusterfuck. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, for the <laughs> California pariah, Jonathan Charney, James, the fat man, Stevens, Rob, the old guy. We're all doomed. See you next week. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.